when you design a system, you have levels of criticality. So typically, if you work for safety critical systems, avionics, a nuclear plant, or you have uh, systems that are safety critical or security critical, I think the distinction is clear. And then you say you have systems that are best effort. What it means, best effort systems? Best effort system is a system where you care about the management of resources, typically a web platform. You take a, a care about the management of resources, but reliability is not a first concern. I mean, if you change the system from time to time, then, I mean, what you care about is that the availability should be beyond, I mean, should not be lower than a threshold that will disappoint the user. And then you have, uh, in the middle also, you have mission critical systems. And you have seven levels of, of, of criticality. Now, what's the difference here? These systems that are critical, in order to develop them, you have to be very careful. You have to test them exhaustively. And you pay a lot of money for that. $1,000 the line of code in some applications. $1,000 the line of code. So these are, and these are small systems. Why these are small systems? Because we don't know how to build, to, to, I mean, we have no theory about how to build a, a, a large system that is a safety critical or security critical. And uh, so just to give you figures here, so 10 to the minus 9 is uh, the reliability of a civilian aircraft. So when you fly, you certified that the probability that you have a problem in 10 to the minus 9, 1 over 1 billion failures per hour. Okay? I mean, if you are lucky, of course, 1 over 1 billion, okay, you have it. Okay, it's one failure. But even a single failure in an aircraft is not a problem. Multiple failures are problems. Okay. So you see that you, there is a very, very small probability that something bad happens. Now, if you are in a rocket and you are a space node, a guy who travels, okay, uh, to take a rocket to travel in the space, this probability is 10 to the minus 6. And uh, for, for, uh, for best effort systems, it's 10 to the minus 4. What it means in practice. Why I, I have, uh, when I was very young, and I was in the US, there were discussions about uh, the reliability of the rockets. Okay? They said, well, let's set it at 10 to the minus 6. And because if it's higher, of course, it's better for the people who travel with uh, rockets. But it would cost, if we multiply by 10 the reliability, the cost will be multiplied by 1,000 or something like that. So you see that today we have this situation. And uh, OK, this is not very promising for the future. And uh, all the, because all the critical systems are autonomous systems, in fact. You have a lot of autonomy in, 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 in critical systems. Okay. And uh, so for autonomous systems, you have a lot of reported failures. And more recently, you see this is uh, uh, three days ago. You've probably seen this. They discovered uh, security flow in uh, an Intel processor. Uh, that is, uh, it, it seems that it allows very serious threats. And uh, now, uh, now uh, many companies are working to together to see how they can uh, find, uh, how they can mitigate, how they can mitigate the effect of, of attacks, okay? Uh, why I, and, and uh, so everybody blamed, of course, Intel for that, and Intel says, no, no, but uh, this security bank is not specific to our computers. Look at our uh, uh, cores, at our processors, you will find the same. So that's a very interesting uh, phenomenon, that security 
is something we cannot, is a problem we cannot fully understand from a technical point of view. Why we cannot fully understand from a technical point of view? I, I don't think that this is impossible. But the problem here is that you have to predict, I mean, to cope with human intelligence. So in order to make a formal validation of it, you have a formal model of the human, what is a human being. Okay. Another problem is that, okay, I'll talk later about security, but this is, this is a very, very serious issue we are facing today in systems engineering. And you have every day, every day you have, you have. and these are, these are problems in, uh, in the processors that exist since 10 years. Okay? I mean, it's not I build a new processor and suddenly I discover a problem. These are processors that are everywhere now over the planet, okay? And you find this problem. Now they say, for instance, that uh, Microsoft will make patches and uh, other companies will make patches, and this may impact the performance of your laptop, okay? if you have Windows, for instance. Okay. So, this is a slide by DARPA. Who knows what DARPA is? Defense Academy. The Defense, defense, uh, the, this is an agency that funds the, the, most of the military research in the United States. So these guys, this is a slide uh, that shows a very important and interesting trend. I don't know uh, if this is readable. From, so the scale here is uh, logarithmic. You have uh, the complexity of the system measured in uh, lines of code, number of lines of code. So these are exponents of 10. This is. Uh, 10 to the 5th, to the 6th, to the 7th, etc. And these are, uh, this is an logarithmic scale costs, development costs. So here, uh, this slide shows that for hardware, the development costs have remained constant despite the exponential increase of complexity over the years. So if you can read here, you will see the different uh, uh, processors of Intel. So you see here Pentium, here Xeon, okay. So the different processors of Intel. Now what it says is that for hardware, we have kept the, the, the cost, the development costs have not exploded, which is not the case for, okay, for uh, systems. So systems is software plus hardware. And here they, they consider the trend for avionic systems, because they are interested in avionic systems, and they say, well, we would like to reduce the development costs, and, uh, okay. and uh, why? Because if this trend is confirmed, then by, say, the year 2070, buy an aircraft to develop a new generation aircraft in the US, you will need the defense budget of the United States. So this is very bad news for, uh, for, for military people, okay? But this is, I know the trends also for civil avionics. For civil avionics, the trend is the same. Also, it's interesting to see that for any now complex system, when you measure the cost, the cost is measured in terms of lines of code. A new car you develop, what counts is the num, the, the complexity in of the code you write for simulation programs and the raw you run. Okay, so that's uh, that, this is uh, this is something to to, to to analyze and understand. Okay, uh, now I, I think I explained that today. Uh, if we want to have autonomous systems and this increase in integration of services uh, that is anticipated by the IoT, we have to face the following problems. We have uh, poor transworthiness. I explained this. Impossibility to guarantee response times in the internet. We understand this. Another issue that is very important is that 
the integration between critical and less critical systems. Because here there is a danger. If so far the critical systems were isolated from the non-critical systems. But if you want to integrate services, you want, for instance, to use your mobile phone, which is a non-critical system, and is open to attacks, to access critical services. So somebody else can take your identity and use this critical service. So you have to be very careful with that. And the final, uh, another important trend is customization with uh, software updates. So probably you know that Tesla, who knows Tesla? Tesla, okay, so they are selling cars that are already autonomous, okay? Uh, so we have autonomous driving features. They change every week the code. So they upload, they, uh, they download new code, okay? And this is something that is, nobody can, I mean, this is something that is not acceptable by all engineering, standard engineering practices uh, so far today. So let me tell you, I have worked a lot with uh, avionics industry. So, uh, so if I serious engineer, critical systems engineer today, and I think there still exists a serious critical engineers in, in Europe in particular, and I hope also in India, uh, by critical system standards, you don't allow any modification of a product that is certified. So clearly for an aircraft that is certified, not only you don't change the software, but you buy in advance if the lifetime of the aircraft is, say, 50 years, you buy in advance processors that you will be using for 50 years. You don't change even the hardware. And this is enforced by the standards and the regulations. So you understand that we have now, everything changes with this practice by Tesla and other companies in the United States. And unfortunately, this is allowed by the authorities. Okay. Now, how the people, the authorities uh, are, are uh, they consider this situation. Last year, no, two years ago, exactly two years ago, there was a meeting at uh, Davos. Uh, Davos, so it's a high-level meeting, it's a summit, it's a, the World Economic Forum in Switzerland every, every January, every month of January. And uh, there were uh, world leaders and uh, key, uh, um, key analysts there. And there was a, a special session about the Internet of Things. And uh, when you, okay, I've seen uh, interviews from this uh, session, and an analyst says, many, believes, many believe that systems can be made secure, dependent, without drastically changing. Okay, so there is no such thing as a secure system, says the analyst. As we give access to devices around us, from drones to thermostats, we need to make sure they cannot be easily hijacked. They will, there will be a learning curve before we make them robust, but, but we will learn. So this is just wishful thinking. Okay. If we don't have the theory, if we don't have a reliable infrastructure, it's not by miracle that this will be done. Okay. So you have uh, such position of official positions. Other people say, Artificial intelligence is uh, the panacea, and uh, okay, we will make everything more intelligent and uh, whatever. Um, I think that artificial intelligence will uh, play a very, very important role in autonomous systems, but it's not by miracle that it will make the system correct. I mean, you need some theory to do that, and we don't have the theory. And you have other people like Elon Musk, who knows Elon Musk, Musk is a leading figure in the United States, CEO of Tesla and other uh, technological companies. And he says, so uh, I really consider autonomous driving a solved problem. I think we are probably less than two years away. This is completely wrong, but he has good reasons to say this because he's selling autonomous cars. 
Now, if you have other people, so this guy here, he's a friend of mine. He's a, a vice president of Google, Vint Cerf. Uh, it's interesting to see what's the position of Google in this uh, debate. And uh, the guy says, uh, take two aspirin and call me in the morning. Uh, in other words, he says that security is a problem. But as we have learned to live with uh, illness, with uh, uh, various problems of epidemics over the planet, we will survive also. And uh, we'll try to do our best. But uh, it's hopeless. I mean, you cannot eradicate this. this. You have to live with this. It's like saying, you have to live with with crime, we have to live with illness, so you have to live with security issues. I mean, this is not this is not a very good message for from a company like uh, like Google. Now, what I think personally, I think that we have uh, to understand the limitations uh, to guarantee the correctness of systems today, and uh, we as uh, researchers, academics. We have to identify relevant research avenues. This is clear. And uh, of course, so far, we had uh, some uh, systems engineering uh, principles that we have to revise. We have to revise, in particular, to take into account what can bring artificial intelligence, which is something I'm going to explain. So what I, we call adaptivity. So uh, the question is, what can, can uh, really artificial intelligence come to the rescue and what kind of problems we can solve, OK? Uh, so let me start by saying that today, system design, I'm talking about computing system design, is uh, very different from the traditional system design. If you're a civil engineer, an electrical engineer, a mechanical engineer. You have theory that allows predictability. What it means predictability? You know that you can guarantee that in the future the system will behave like that. Okay? And if I am a civil engineer, I will, uh, even if I have to build, say, a, a huge bridge, I write down, okay, I have the theory, I write down equations, I solve the equations, I know with a very high probability that the bridge will not collapse for centuries. So you should understand that computing, for various reasons, other people say this is only a, a, a 70 years old discipline. So it's a young discipline. It has not reached maturity. So, okay, so we don't have a full, complete, unified theoretical foundations. This is one story. I don't believe in that. We never have nice theories in physics, in computing, so we have to explore other approaches. But today we don't have we don't have theory to guarantee the the quality and performance of systems we build. And you know that uh, in uh, but these are these are things that are not uh, these are stories that uh, are not uh, told by the press because okay a lot of failures in building uh, complex systems. Uh, OK, so today, um, when you design a system, an autonomous system, a critical system, you rely on two approaches, on two key ideas, two pillars, two pillars to system design. <coughs> One is verification. What it means verification? I, I got that during a work for my contribution to theories of verification. So. The idea is that I want to I build a system, and instead of building a system and testing it, because I don't have theory, I can build a model of the system. So before I build the system, I build a model of the system, so I have a model of the system. Or even I can have not a model of the system, I can have a model of the process of building of the system. And then, on the other hand, I have requirements, and I have a method that checks the model against the requirements. And the, this is a verification method. So I say the conclusion of this is yes, no, or don't know. I don't know. I 
don't know. Yes, okay. So because of complexity problems, because of complexity issues, in some cases, because you need a full exploration, it's not that just testing, you need a full exploration of all the state space of the system, and this can be huge. And when I say huge, okay, just to explain this, if I have a, a, a program with, or a computer with 300 bits, 300 bits is nothing. 300 bits is nothing. Uh, how many states I have if I have 300 bits? How many possible states I have with 300 bits? Two to, two to the, two to the uh, three, 300. How big is this number? Two to 300. How big is the number? Can, can you figure out? <laughs> Very big. This is the dimension of the, uh, of the universe, in fact. I mean, okay, you can add that. Uh, yeah, but this, uh, this is more or less the dimension of the universe. So if I have 300 bits, okay, not, not gi gigabits or whatever, okay? So you see that I have to explore a huge, even the simplest program is, has a huge potential number of states. So you have what we call the explosion, the complexity explosion that you have. In. So this, now we have techniques to analyze systems that are but by, uh, by doing some kind of abstraction, okay, but the, the very basic problem is, is of huge complexity. And uh, I have spent more than 40 years uh, trying uh, try to fight against this complexity. But this is not the only issue. So you, you should be able to build a model and also to write correct requirements. In some cases, we are not able to write correct requirements because if the requirement are given to a computer, it should be given in some mathematical form, okay? So the requirements is what I expected my system does, and the model is, uh, sorry, the model is, uh, is what the system does, okay? Now the model will be a mathematical model, and there are different techniques for doing that, that we extract from the software of the system or from the description of the hardware of the system or both. I'm not going to talk about that. This is too technical. <coughs> but now the problem is how to write correct requirements. Okay, so if, the, if your model is, uh, say, hardware, uh, hardware, we know how to verify fairly complex hardware. And with what we did on model checking, we can verify complex hardware. Because the models are simple to get, and the requirements easy to understand. Now, if uh, I come to other systems, the requirements are much harder to formalize. So typically, just to go back here, I have worked with uh, avionics and uh, satellite systems. The requirements for satellite systems are, in English, are two books, thick like that. And uh, you have the requirements. You read, engineers read. So what is said in one page may contradict something said 10 pages uh, or 20 pages later, OK? So uh, when you write requirements, there are engineers for that. But uh, requirements should be consistent, well formalizable, etc. Now, it's interesting to see what it means to understand the requirements for self-driving cars. So for self-driving cars, if I want to verify a self-driving car, I have to understand the requirements. These are requirements, they call behavioral competencies by a project, this is the California Path project led by uh, Berkeley University. This is a project that exists since the beginning of the 90s. I have participated in that project. So you cannot read all this, but just consider a few of these the requirements detect and respond to speed limit changes and speed advisories. Oh, how to express this mathematically? It's not as simple as saying that uh, this variable should be less than this value, okay? It's because uh, when, it, when you deal with requirements of this nature, you 
have to take into account many, many things, in particular the physics of the cards, etc. So uh, it's a problem arising for X requirement. The second problem we have today is that hardware is becoming very, very complex. We have hardware that is now, you, have, uh, you don't have single processors, you have networks of, of processors, NOx, networks on chip, and you have many core process, uh, processors. So I, uh, this is a very hard technical problem. How the software you see is just a mathematical relation. When you run it on a hardware, it inherits all the dynamics of all the dynamics pro properties of the hardware, okay? So in order to understand how this will behave, uh, this is a very, very difficult problem. How to predict the behavior of this and figure out all of the bad situations that can appear and then make verification. This is becoming too technical. Okay, so I'll skip this. And uh, so to say that verification is uh, limited to hardware or simple software. And uh, another thing I would like to explain is that if you rely on verification, because there is no science behind, Okay, that, that this has to do with the, the concept of scientific truth. Scientific truth has a social dimension. You should understand this. If I claim that, you remember there was uh, 10, there were 10, 20 years ago, a lot of discussion about Fermat's theorem. Who knows Fermat's theorem? Fermat's theorem. Fermat's theorem. Fermat was a French mathematician. He claimed that Okay, some theorem holds, and then mathematicians from all over the world kept struggling to bring a solution to that problem. Suddenly, different people appeared and said, I have solved, uh, I have proven correct Fermat's theorem. But if you say that I have proven it correct, somebody should check your proof. Hmm? And this is the community of mathematicians that say, okay, he provided the right proof. Now, and also this is for any concept of truth in society. In society, you have institutions that say, this is a good lift, you can take this lift, or this is a toaster, you buy this toaster, and the toaster is certified. Certified means that it will not, will not kill you if you use it properly, because certified according to standards, okay? so. It's not enough to say that I built a system that I have proven correct, etc. You should provide evidence to certification authorities that your system is correct. And this is something different. Okay. So you may be genius and uh, uh, build systems that are of exceptional quality, but the certification authorities will say, I need the proof. Otherwise, I don't give the stamp for your system to be used. Okay? So you have this social dimension also that is very important. And now I come to a very serious issue that is this one. You know that in autonomous systems we will be using uh, learning devices for various reasons. And this is a good thing to use learning techniques. Now, learning techniques, if you show this to a certification authority, they will try to understand how learning techniques work. Who has an idea about how learning techniques work? Can learning techniques be certified? To be certified, you should be able to verify that they work properly. And the approach is that you have some requirements and you check the, the requirements against the behavior of the system. So just to give you an example, if somebody comes and says, I have a learning system that can distinguish a, a cat from a dog. So this is a genius system distinguishes between a cat and a dog. Okay, so I'm a certification authority. I will say, what are the requirements for the cat? What are the requirements for, for the dog? And how it distinguishes it? But this is not the way learning systems learn today. Learning systems learn like kids, okay? They have enough images of cats and dogs, success and failure, and they learn. 
So all the approach, the standard engineering approach is not applicable to learning system. So this is an additional issue to be addressed. Is that clear? Do you, do you understand this? All the AI technologies is not, cert, is not certified and will never be certified. So we have to change our, our, our acceptance criteria. Okay. Any questions so far? Am I going too fast? How children uh, understand cat and dog, babies, newborn? question. I think that's by trial and error, okay, as, as neural systems understand. So you don't explain, you don't explain to a system, look, a full detailed description of a cat and a dog. And so far for computers, we really explain in a very analytic manner what to do. And that's the big gap now between traditional computer systems engineering and artificial intelligence, okay? But if you want to prove that the program is correct, we say, for instance, my program computes this function, it's very simple. I mean, it's very simple to understand as a program because you say, okay, it has an input, an output, and it, I give x, it computes f of x. Okay, I make a proof, but, but for, for learning techniques, this is not applicable. I understand in the following way. Babies are new to the problem. Newborn is new to the problem. Any person who is outsider, who is outsider, external, he is not knowing the problem. He is a baby for that problem. He can solve the problem much better way than the expert within the system. So, my students, our students, yes. who may not know anything, they're outsiders. They can see the problem and they can analyze much better than you and me. That uh, is my statement. Yes, I don't know if the analogy is uh, okay. But, but, but you see that we have another type of engineering and, and uh, of course we you should have techniques. Okay. Now, another approach, another pillar of modern systems engineering is, uh, is the V-model. So what is the V model? The V model says that if you want to develop a car, an aircraft, whatever, you will uh, follow this uh, V figure. You start, you analyze here the requirements and you build an architecture, you make the detailed design, here you find components, you integrate components, you test components separately, then you uh, uh, do the integration testing and you go up testing and find whether what you get finally agrees with what we wanted to build. And here again, this figure now is not applicable anymore uh, because of various reasons. But you see, when I was a student, uh, in our course of software engineering, they were saying you should apply this. If you find a modern software engineer and you tell him you apply the V model, he will kill you. He'll say, you are, you are Crazy? Why? Because if you are an electrical engineer, you understand very well the requirements because the requirements are rooted in theories of physics. The requirements for computing systems are of very different nature. Okay? So we have systems we don't, we don't know how to express the requirements because in our mental toolbox, we don't have perhaps the, the, the right concepts or, or the natural language we are using are not, is not good enough. Or we have not, okay. So I'm not going to talk about that. I could uh, talk about that for, for hours, but this is a problem that uh, today uh, even software engineers, they apply what they call agile techniques. So they say, we don't un fully understand the requirements. It's not a problem. Let's have very, very brilliant people, a group of very brilliant people start writing some prototypes.